we're going to look at um, statistics. Um, and the reason we're going to talk about statistics now, in fact, we're going to talk over uh, two components about statistics, is because it's vital to the analysis of metabolomic data. And, and most people, um, when they're coming into metabolomics, um, discover A, they didn't take a stats course, and, and B, the type of statistics that you're typically expected to do for metabolomics are, is completely foreign to what you are mostly used to. So I'm going to try and give you, a, I guess, a light introduction to statistics. I'm not going to try and present it as you know, theorem, proof, lemma. Uh, I'm going to try and make it a, a little more reasonable and, and hopefully more understandable. So again, we're down in the last part here, introduction to stats. Tomorrow we'll talk about stats again, sort of extending it. And then we'll dive into how to use the metaboanalyst as a tool, uh, which uses a lot of statistics to interpret all of the metabolomic data that you've acquired through, through here. So statistics um, scares a lot of people away. Uh, and lots of people have very strong opinions about it. Here are some opinions. Um, so Benjamin Disraeli, who was the Prime Minister of, of England, um, came up with this quote. Three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and the worst of all, statistics. The other one that I like to say is that 98% of all statistics are made up. Um, another one is like statistics are like bikinis. What they reveal is suggestive. What they conceal is vital. But I, I think another way of thinking about statistics and it, really the history of statistics is to try and convert uh, intuition and impression into something that's mathematical. And by converting something that's sort of intuition and impression into mathematics, it gives it, some, to some extent, greater authority. So in that regard, statistics is the mathematics of impressions. And I think that's a useful thing to remember. So the reason why statistics uh, is used or discussed is because we're basically dealing with um, distributions and to try and assess whether something is significantly different or distinct from a distribution. And the distribution that we're most used to dealing with is um, a univariate distribution, or essentially a single variable. So in this case, uh, I'm taking a population of about, I guess, 25, 30 individuals and with individuals, we can measure a single value. Uh, from these, we could measure things like height. That's a, a unit variant variable. Uh, we could also measure their weight. And again, you probably see a distribution in weights. Uh, we could measure their IQ. And we'd also get some, again, a distribution. But these are single variables. We're not measuring height plus IQ. or not measuring weight plus height. We're just measuring a single variable. So univariate is a term that's used in statistics. It's distinct from multivariate, which means many. So univariate, single variable. That makes sense. And as I said, these are things where it's just a single number. It's quantitatively measured. It's a range. It's not something a yes, no. It has to have some kind of measurable range. It has to be quantitative. So if you're to take a sufficiently large population and plot a univariate value for that population, height, weight, IQ, you will get almost invariably this. So we call it a bell curve, we call it a normal distribution, or we also call it the Gaussian distribution after Carl Friedrich Gauss who came up with uh, the, the mathematics behind it. And it's actually, it's, it's truly remarkable that so many things that we measure uh, in nature, in physics, chemistry, in biology, um, follow this curve. So each of, or every distribution, every Gaussian distribution, every normal distribution has a, a characteristic. Uh, it has a characteristic average or mean. Uh, it is a symmetric distribution. That's important to remember. 
the width of that distribution is called the standard deviation. So you can have a narrow distribution or you can have a wide distribution, but overall the shape looks like a bell or a Gaussian one. So it is the most common type of distribution that we, we know of. It, it, it matches to, to remarkably uh, many, many things. There are some other types of distributions which do show up under certain circumstances, uh, but this is far and away the most common. So as I say, almost any set of biological, chemical, or physical measurements will display some univariate variation that shows some, uh, can be measured in some, some way, will show that normal distribution. The other thing that people have found is that the larger the sample set, the more normal the curve looks. The more symmetric it looks, the smoother it looks. One thing that people also found that is that to get something that looks like a normal distribution is you need to have a sample size of about 30 to 40. It's not 50, it's not 100, it's not 10. And this is actually one of the reasons why class sizes in schools are about 30 students. And that had to do with testing and uh, actually in the early days of IQ testing, but other things. So it allowed them to get the normal distribution or ensure that they were able to get a normal distribution. So the Gaussian distribution uh, can be described with an equation. Uh, it's an e to the minus x squared distribution. Uh, but in detail, uh, it has a few more parameters. Um, it's plotting x versus y, or probability of x um, in the y-axis and x in the bottom. And what you can see is that um, there's a sigma, which represents um, the standard deviation, sigma squared, which represents the variance, x, which is the variable you're plotting, mu, which is the average. So plugging in all these numbers, you can generate this curve, and then you can see various bars that are drawn to indicate the span of one or two sigmas, um, which covers a certain area. So mu plus or minus a sigma gives you 68% of the area. Mu plus or minus two sigmas will give you about 95% of the area. Mu plus or minus three sigma will give you about 99% of the area. With a univariate distribution, you can calculate the mean. I think everyone knows how to do that. Um, you can calculate the variance, which is the difference between um, a point and the average uh, summed over all the points um, divided by n. And then the, the square root of the variance is called the standard deviation. So again, these intervals that I talked about, um, this portion or the area under the curve, um, is what allows you to define um, probabilities in some respects. Uh, it's also how we define grades in schools or university. I'm not sure what the grading scheme in Australia is. I don't know if, but certainly in North America they use A, B, C, D, um, and F. And a lot of decisions about grading um, is defined by how many standard deviations above the mean you are. Um, so if you're one standard deviation uh, above the mean, it's a B. If you're at standard deviation, it's a C. Two standard deviations is an A. Three standard deviations is an A+. Plus. Two standard deviations below the mean is a fail. And this has a lot to do with the, essentially the probabilities, the number of people that would be expected in a group to have those sorts of grades. Um, and um, it can also be used, uh, especially when they talk about polling data, when they say whether there's a 5% chance that it's, um, or a significance level of 5%. This has to do with the two standard deviation cutoff. So significance has a lot to do with this. And this is where, obviously, if someone gets a super high grade, that's very significant. It means there are many standard deviations away from the group. Um, so the probability that something might be one standard deviation if everything is random, uh, one standard deviation away, 
whether it's large or smaller, is, is, uh, from the mean is about 32%. If you're more than two standard deviations away, the probability of that occurring by chance is 5%. Probability of chance uh, by chance of something that's more than three standard deviations above or below the mean is tiny. It's 0.3%. And so these are some cutoffs that people use to say, is this something that could occur by chance, or is this something that could occur by chance? So if something is typically scoring at one standard deviation above the mean, uh, it could be just a lucky guess or a lucky exam or uh, a lucky performance. But if something is performing at two standard deviations or three standard deviations away from the mean, there's something there. So this is where the grading comes in, and as I say, in North America, we use letters. And if you score average, it's a C. If you're a standard deviation, it's a B. If you're two standard deviations, it's an A. So in statistics, people also use a, another term called the p-value, uh, where p stands for probability. And that's the probability of obtaining uh, test t statistic, so that's a general term for a score, a set of events, an IQ, a height, a weight, whatever, as at least as extreme as the one that was actually observed. So, um, you know, what's the probability that someone could take a, a very, very difficult test and get 100% on it? Um, so you talk about uh, accepting or rejecting a null hypothesis in statistics. And so one rejects the null hypothesis, saying that nothing is significant. When the p-value is less than um, a significance level. And usually the significance level that you choose can be 0.05 for 5%. Or in some cases, it can be 0.01 for 1%. It can also be 0.1 or 10%. In fact, it's arbitrary, and there's no hard and fast rule that it has to be 5%. This is something that many people forget and will sometimes simply say that if my p-value is 0.06, everything's a bust, and I'll throw out all my data. Um, so when the null hypothesis is rejected, um, the result is statistically significant. So that's the way the statistician thinks. So if we were to look at this in terms of height, and if we say that for all humans, male and female, the average height is 5 feet 7 inches, or that's about 1.7 meters, I think. And if the standard deviation is roughly um, 5 inches or about uh, 10 or 11 centimeters, what's the probability of finding someone who is more than 2 meters, 2.02 meters, or 6 feet 10 inches? So I'm going to work with inches and feet now since that's how we still measure height here in North America. So in this case, if you choose an alpha of 0.05 based on that standard deviation, you can propose this hypothesis. Is someone who is 6 foot 11 still a member of the human species, given that they're so much taller than any other human that you've measured. And you could also have another hypothesis is if you choose an alpha of 0.01, uh, is someone who's 6 feet 11 inches still a member of the human species? And so with the two standard deviations, um, you'd only be able to go up to, um, I guess, 6 feet um, 5 inches um, is the maximum height. And so uh, in that regard, we would suggest that the person can't be human. But if we used an alpha of 0.01, they probably are. So we can, at least with this hypothesis, we can assume that most basketball players are human. Another approach is this idea, which is perhaps a little more practical. If you flip a coin, heads or tails, 20 times, and you get 14 heads out of those, what's the probability that that would occur. And you can calculate it. And the probability is 
So if you choose an alpha value of 0 0.05, is this a fair coin? And in fact, you'd say yes. But if you chose a, point, a value of 0 0.1, uh, you'd determine that this is not a fair coin. And your choice of alpha is somewhat arbitrary. And as I said, there's a tendency for most people in the field of statistics um, to be kind of relaxed on which alpha they choose, but everyone who's not in statistics to be incredibly rigid about the alpha they choose. And they always choose 0.05 with often no justification. It's just a convenient number. And it happens that it's associated with the two standard deviation rule. So distributions are not always symmetric. And to deal with the fact that some distributions are skewed, um, people came up with a way of um, describing them in terms of their tendency towards uh, an, an average. So there's a mean, a median, and a mode. So in normal distributions, which are symmetric, the mean, median, and mode are identical. But in skewed distributions, as seen here, they aren't. So the mean is the average value. So it's pretty useful, but it can be affected quite severely by extreme values. So if there's a real a real strong outlier or some skewness, then the mean isn't necessarily the best indicator of the uh, centrality of the distribution. The median um, or the mode can often be a better one. And it sort of depends on what you want. So the median is kind of considered it's the middlemost value. It's halfway between the mode and the mean. The mode is the most common value, or in this case, the highest part of the distribution. And most of us will tend to pick that peak, and that's where we tend to identify as the, the centrality point. And in this case, you can see how the mean is not at the center, if you want, of that distribution or at the highest point. It's kind of skewed to the right. So that's, again, something to remember and be aware of, given that there, there can be skewed distributions. Also, in univariate distri distributions, most are unimodal but it can also be possible to have bimodal and trimodal distributions, two peaks or three peaks. That's a problem, and it usually suggests, in fact, you, you do have two different populations, and you probably need to redesign or rethink your experiment to some extent. There are other kinds of distributions, and in fact, uh, the easiest, best understood one is the binomial distribution which taken to an extreme is the Gaussian distribution. There's also Poisson distributions, extreme value distributions, uh, exponential or extreme uh, skewed distributions. So the binomial distribution, uh, again, is something that, that Gauss played with, discovered. You can take a polynomial, P plus Q, and if you take different uh, orders of N, you get different coefficients. So P plus Q to the zeroth power produces, by definition, 1. p plus q to the first power will have coefficients in front of p and q of 1 each. p plus q to the second power will have p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, so the coefficients are 1, 2, 1. p plus q to the third power, you'll get coefficients of 1, 3, 3, 1. to the fourth power, 1, 4, 6, 4, all the way up. And so if you essentially go to an infinite power, p plus q to the n, um, you will get something that approximates very closely uh, the Gaussian distribution. Um, and you can see as we start adding or increasing in, this shape, this distribution of coefficients looks increasingly more like a Gaussian. So P and Q are probabilities, probability of something, an event happening and not happening. If P and Q are basically balanced, and that's also something that uh, is characteristic of a Gaussian distribution. If P and Q are very different, um, then you can start getting things that are more characteristic of a, of a Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution varies uh, with respect to the value of mu, or the average. In some cases, it looks almost like an exponentially decaying function. In other cases, it looks more like a skewed distribution. And then as mu gets very large, it looks actually like a Gaussian 
So this is a, essentially a changing distribution that's a function of, of um, u. Now it's often characteristic or used to describe radioactive decay and a few other things, but it's, it's in the extreme case, the Poisson distribution trends to a Gaussian distribution. There's another type of distribution called an extreme value distribution. And this is one that's typically used uh, in evaluating uh, sequence alignments and sequence scores. So if anyone's ever done a blast alignment, um, you are working with an extreme value distribution and the significance of blast scores has to do with working with extreme values. It's formally a sampling of the tails, the extreme tails of a Gaussian distribution. So you can take the upper tail or the back tail of a distribution and you can get a very skewed distribution. So if we took the tail, we would get this skewed distribution. Typically in a university, uh, that's what we do is we take the top graduates from secondary schools and move them into university. And we do a, a bit of a mistake in that we assume that the collection or the student body is actually a normal distribution, and it's not. By very definition, by choosing the top students, um, we've essentially created a, a skewed extreme value distribution. Um, so in that regard, uh, an extreme value distribution is formally skewed, and often you'll find some very extreme values that are quite away from the mean or the mode. It's also in an extreme value, it's, it's more difficult to do good statistical tests. That's why BLAST had to do a lot of, well, had to work with statisticians to get some really useful interpretation of those extreme values. So it's, it's not unusual to find these skewed distributions. They're, they'll occur particularly when you're measuring things like sound or, or light intensity. Um, it's also possible to get these same kinds of skewed distributions when you're measuring metabolite concentrations. Um, but there's a trick that statisticians discovered that you can actually fix these skewed distributions so they look like Gaussian distributions or normal distributions. And it's called a transformation. It's called a log transformation. And by taking the log of values, it allows you to normalize things and to produce a Gaussian-like distribution. So on the left side is an example of kind of a, a skewed or extreme value distribution where things are plotted in a linear scale. And if you do a log transformation, that distribution now looks Gaussian. When things are in a Gaussian state, then you can do good statistical tests on them. If they aren't in a Gaussian state, then the, the statistical tests that we commonly develop or perform are less reliable. So it's very important to try and produce a normal distribution. And we talked a little bit about that the other day, about scaling, sample scaling and data scaling and trying to get things balanced. Here's some real data where, again, you get a skewed distribution where there's something that's very big at the, at the base and then you've got a bunch of sort of extreme values. If you take the log of those values, you get something that maybe isn't perfectly um, Gaussian, but it certainly looks a lot closer to a Gaussian distribution. And so, again, this is something that statisticians have known for a long time, but is very, very useful in trying to get a normal distribution. And, and that's critical to being able to do good statistics. So we're going to talk about normalization and, and scaling where we might be looking at different populations. Again, this is something we talked about before with um, statistical spectroscopy. We had two populations, uh, green people and blue people, um, and we measure their height. Now, I think you'll, if you look closely, um, these people are probably all about the same height, um, but what if our ruler was off? It was miscalibrated so that the the green people um, had uh, a ruler that, that was measuring um, too short. So we, we could get this biased result. This is a, a bias where, in fact, it's, it's a mistake. It's a systematic error. Um, how do we deal with that? 
well, we can go back to our ruler and compare the rulers and readjust things. And if we make that adjustment to the systematic bias, we would get something like this. And they're basically the same. So this is something that we talked about with you know, sample dilution. If things were too dilute and you didn't calibrate, or if you're using too little of one sample from one cohort and too much of a sample from the other cohort, you'll get biased values in terms of your concentrations or measurements. So this is an important thing, that, that scaling or adjusting for those dilution effects or sample size effects or miscalibration effects is important. Now, some people call that normalization. Some people call it scaling. It's a bit confusing. Um, other people also call scaling and normalization this conversion of making a skewed distribution look like a normal distribution. So the word normal means make it look like a normal distribution. So this is an example of normalization as well. So different people, different communities will use different words and you'll find me using things like scaling and normalization almost interchangeably. And so I'll apologize for, for that now, <laughs> but it's, it, it's still confusing within the community. So one is, I say, adjusting things for bias. Another one is essentially turning um, a distribution so that it's normally distributed. And this is what we talked about between sample scaling versus data scaling. So if we had a situation where we were looking at normal people and a bunch of leprechauns, um, this is where we're now looking at two distinct populations. Most of you would have a simple observation that the leprechauns are shorter than normal humans. Um, now this is, gets back to this whole point about statistics is the mathematics of impression. I think everyone here can see that the leprechauns are shorter. But if you told a statistician that, they wouldn't believe you because they want to see some math. So the question here is, you've done the measurement, you've got a correct ruler, um, and the question you're going to ask is, are these two distributions different? And are they statistically different? So this is a, the most common question asked in statistics. It's the most common question asked in metabolomics as well. And you're trying to determine these things. In this case, it's not height that we're typically looking at, but it's concentrations of different metabolites. And instead of people or individuals who have names, these are now metabolites with names. So that's an easy one, uh, at least for our eyes to tell, and also probably easy for statistics. What if you have this thing, where at least to our eyes, to my eyes, they look like they're about the same height. And if we actually take our ruler and measure them, there's a little difference. But is that statistically different? I don't know. This is where a statistician is your best friend because they'll be able to tell you firmly whether there's really a difference. And this is the basis to, as I say, probably one of the most common tests performed in statistics. It's called the t-test. Also, the student's t-test, named after a pseudonym of a statistician who called himself student. Um, so it's fundamentally used to determine if two populations are different. It allows you to calculate the probability that whether two sample means are the same. So this will produce a test statistic. And based on your alpha, which is your cutoff value, you can determine whether the populations are the same or different. So if a t-test statistic gives you a p-value of 0.4 and your cutoff is 0.05, then you can say the populations are the same. If the t-test statistic gives you a p-value of 0.04, which is less than your cutoff, in this case 0.05, then you can say the two populations are different. So this is the cutoff, and as I say, the alpha is arbitrary. It doesn't always have to be 0.05, and that's what a lot of people forget. You can do paired and unpaired uh, t-statistics. Uh, typically use paired tests if you're using sort of a time series before and after. Well, unpaired tests are typically best chosen for sort of two groups, two cohorts, two randomly chosen samples.
So healthy versus sick. You can also use t-tests to do or determine whether clusters are significantly different. This isn't commonly used, probably should be, but uh, you can kind of see that those two clusters look different. And if those clusters are roughly following a normal distribution, you can assess whether these things have a, a mean uh, that is statistically different. So in some cases, if you're short on collecting data, and instead of collecting 400 samples, you're collecting 20 samples, or 30-ish, you'll find that your distributions aren't quite normal. So that's not impossible to deal with. Statistics are a little harder. What you have to use is something called the Mann-Whitney-U test. It's also called the Wilcoxon rank sum test. Now, notice that really the assessment of whether something is normal or normally distributed or not is up to your eyes. You have to make that call. You're going to look at that distribution. And there might be some people in this group who say, that looks normal enough to me, or Gaussian enough. There are others who say, mm, no, this is kind of a mess. I think I'm going to go to the Mann-Whitney U test. It's a more powerful, more robust test than the basic student's t-test. And in this case, you're calculating medians rather than means. So medians are a little less susceptible to extreme values. Um, and so that's the basis to the Mann-Whitney U test. And if you calculate its MU test statistic, or it's called just simply the U test, and you can use the same cutoffs. If it's a P equals 0 0.4, that's what you get. And you had a cutoff of 0.05. Two populations are the same. And if it's below 0.05, the two populations are different. So you can use the same thresholding, but it still uses a, sort of a different, somewhat more complex math. So, so this is for distinguishing two populations. That's the most common type of metabolomic test, most common type of genetic transcriptomic, proteomic test as well. Sometimes you're looking at three different populations. So suppose we're looking at normals, leprechauns, and tiny elves. So what you're going to look at here is, you know, are they distinct? Do they have different heights? They're all collected from Ireland, so we've got the characteristic colors. Um, so this is a case of... Um, how they, how they settle, how they distribute. The question is, are they different? That's obvious by eyes. You still have to convince the statistician, though. This one is less obvious. And if we plotted out their height, uh, we'd see a distribution that's almost overlapping for all three. So instead of two populations, we're dealing with three populations. You don't use a t-test, and you don't use a man whitney u test you use something called analysis of variance, ANOVA. So this is used when you have three or more populations. Technically, it's a generalization of the t-test, and it's a statistical test, or produces a statistic value to determine whether or not the means, just like with the t-test, of several groups are equal. So it's rephrasing the t-test, but it's looking at several groups, and you use something called the F measure to test for significance. You can have one-way, two-way, or three-way, or N-way ANOVAs if we have a population or two N different populations. So the most common ANOVA is just the one-way. It's just basically said, is any of the three populations different? It's not asking which pair is different. It's just, is any of them different? In this case, we might say all three are different. So you can use ANOVA if you're dealing with three clusters, or four clusters, or five clusters, to determine whether these clusters are different as well. So that can give you more assessment, statistical significance. But rarely people use that for cluster differentiation. People just simply draw ellipsoids and say, ta-da. That's, I guess, the way we're doing it now. So 
we can also, uh, as we go up the scale in terms of um, one, two, or three, we can start getting up to n populations. And technically, we could still use ANOVA. Um, but if we're starting to look at, at many, many variables, things start, start getting more complicated. And this is often the characteristic of metabolomic data, where we're measuring 100 metabolites on average per sample, or maybe 1,000 metabolites. Or in proteomics, 5,000 proteins, or genomics, 20,000 genes. So you could do a whole bunch of pairwise comparisons with this population, uh, these distributions. And some are well separated, some are fully overlapping. And the question is, how many of these are, are really significant? So if we had um, 100 different t-tests looking at a, a population of um, um, multiple numbers of, of, of groups or a population, what are the odds using a p-value of 0.05 that one of these things is actually going to be a false positive, that we think they're distinct, but in fact it's just a, an occurrence of randomness. So you can do the calculation, um, which is what's the probability, so 1 minus the probability um, to the hundredth power. You can calculate that. And for 100 co pairwise comparisons, you come up with a probability that at least one of those randomly will produce what appears to be a significant difference uh, with almost 100%. So what's that, what that is basically saying is that if you're going to be looking at um, um, 100 metabolites and you're going to be comparing different populations or groups, uh, you're going to find, by random chance, one of those um, will seem to be very stati statistically significant, but it's, it's just random chance. In fact, there'll be quite a few more than that that will be statistically significantly different, um, but just by random chance, using your cutoff of 0.05. So what it might suggest is that you want to actually, rather than using a cutoff of 5%, you should use a cutoff of 1% or 0.1% or 0.005% or whatever it's here. And in fact, this is what was proposed or determined by a fellow named Bonferroni, uh, an Italian statistician, uh, who said that what she want to do to avoid the problem of finding these false discoveries, these misleading um, answers, the things that make you think you found something worth publishing in nature, um, only to be found out to be false, um, is this Bonferroni correction. And his suggestion was to take your cutoff, your alpha, and divide by the number of comparisons you're going to be performing. So if it's 100 different t-tests, divide 0.05 by 100. So that's what your p-value has to be. So this is something that is well understood in the field of GWAS studies, so genome-wide association studies. And they'll typically use Bonferroni corrections quite rigorously, dropping down to or dividing by um, often 10 to the 6th, so dividing by 10 to the 6th. So really, really tiny values. And so they're looking for things that are uh, statistically significant through this t-test assessment of 10 to the minus 8 as their cutoff. Now what people realized is that, in fact, this is probably too strict. And most other approaches, other than the GWAS people, use a softer method for false discovery um, correction. So in the example here, um, we can have a bunch of probabilities given wh whether it'll be rainy, sunny, foggy, cloudy, snowy, um, whether there'll be an eclipse or thunder, um, 
anyways, in terms of we do know that something tomorrow will happen, but only one pr prediction is significant in terms of a p-value uh, with a Bonferroni correction. Uh, in this case, an eclipse. So this is a case where sometimes you have to go through something that's really extreme. And as I say, what people really wanted to do was come up with this better method. And this is something that was picked up by two statisticians called Benjamani and Hochberg. And the idea was, again, if you had 100 different t-tests and you found 20 results that had a p-value of less than 0.05, what are the odds that one of these is going to be false. Because in 100 t-tests, you're not going to find a whole bunch. You're not going to find every single one of them are going to be under 0.05. Some are going to be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. But of the 20, which ones of those ones are going to be less than 0 0.05? And so they determined that out of that set, roughly 20 uh, times 0 0.05, roughly one of those will be a false positive. So what they essentially do, in a very simple-minded way, is they adjust the p-value. And instead of dividing by 100, um, they divide by 20. So instead of looking for a p-value that's now dropped to 0 0.0005, it's now 0 0.0025. So the threshold is lower. So this is a simplified way of doing it. And in fact, mathematically, it's much more complex and something that I still don't understand. But fortunately, there are some R code or programs that do this for you. What the R programs do is sort of assess a, a, or create a plot and produce a p-value by, by ranking. And uh, they will rank the p-values from best to worst. So it's, it's not the numerical value of the p-value, it's their rank. So typically, um, in this thing, if you're getting something that was fairly random, you would get almost something that looks like a straight line in terms of the, the p-value. And according to this, you might get 10 or 11 tests that are significant using an alpha of 0.05. If you had something that was more realistic, and this is what they did. They worked with realistic assembled data. They found that the behavior for a lot of real data didn't follow the straight line, it followed this kind of line. Um, and, and what they decided to do was basically look at this inflection point um, in more detail and converted that into uh, a line that they marked sort of with the blue of uh, where things should be ranked. And so using this plot, which is complicated, and we won't get into it too far, is that they're able to come up with not a p-value, but a corrected p-value that they call a q-value. Um, and it essentially allows them to determine how many of these values are significant and therefore how much you should divide by. So whether it's metabolomics, proteomics, genomics, you often have to deal with false discovery rates. And as a rule, if the statistical tools can give you your q-values, those are the ones you want to focus on because these are the ones that are dealing with the false discovery rates and dealing with the fact that you're dealing with 50 to 100 different metabolites or 1,000 metabolites, whatever it is. So rather than looking at p-values, if you're doing metabolomics, look at q-values. Those are the ones you should be quoting. And these will deal with the problems of the false discovery rates. But don't punish yourself and use the Bonferroni correction because it's too extreme. So I think actually we'll wrap that up. Because